Hello and welcome to ArcGIS Runtime for Utilities. We're going to cover a number of topics today, including taking your data offline, working with annotation, and working with the new utility network in Runtime. My name is Nick Furness and I'm a product manager for the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs. Over the next few minutes, I'll give you an overview of the various approaches available in the ArcGIS Runtime to take your data and apps offline. Let's do a quick overview of what we mean by a map. In a web map, we have some JSON that glues together a bunch of different layers. These could be tiled layers coming from a tile service, feature layers coming either directly from a feature service or from a feature layer item, which itself connects to the feature service and provides some overrides, for example, for pop-ups and rendering and the like. A vector tile layer coming from a vector tile service uh, or a vector tile layer that points to a vector tile layer item in ArcGIS Online, which similarly to the feature layer item points at the originating service and has style overrides. So you would create these with a vector tile style editor, for example. When we talk about maps offline, though, we have a structure that mimics what we just saw in the web map. So we have some JSON that glues together different layer types, as we saw before with the web map. Only this time, the data sources are not services. They're going to be local files on the device, a TPK or tile package, a runtime geodatabase that essentially contains a snapshot of data from a feature service. Overrides are handled as well, vector tile layers, and vector tile layers with style resources can also be taken offline as VTPKs. So there's a few approaches to getting these offline maps to a runtime app. One of them is to generate this single mobile map package object. Um, this is authored by ArcGIS Pro, sideloading that mobile map package file directly onto your device and letting the runtime work with that. This supports read-only workflows. This is a, a generated file that's sideloaded to the device, uh, but it can include locators and transportation networks. Often this is important if you have your own non-public system for getting around your uh, facilities and you want to generate your own custom network data model. Once you have this mobile map package and it's on the device, um, it's very simple to use. Here's some pseudocode. You create a mobile map package object in runtime and point it at the local file. You load the mobile map package, which allows runtime to inspect the file and find out what contents it has, and you get a map from it. Now, it's a mobile map package, so it could have multiple maps, um, but you get this fully hydrated runtime map object, which you can just pass to the map view, and all of a sudden you have a fully interactive map in your application. So that's a single mobile map package file side loaded down. But we have another workflow which revolves around a more connected, or we call it occasionally connected scenario. So you can point your runtime app at a web map and take that web map offline. These web maps are authored in ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Enterprise, published to ArcGIS Enterprise. These are downloaded by the runtime to a directory of your choice on your device. And there are two ways that we approach this occasionally connected scenario. We have a pre-planned workflow and we have an on-demand workflow. In the pre-planned workflow, uh, as we'll see in a second, uh, the author of the map also authors a selection of predefined map areas. These can be polygons or extents, and these are packaged up on an interval by uh, the portal backend. So we may generate, we may specify four or five of these things. The portal will create them uh, in the background. Uh, you have full control over the schedule. And these map packages are then available so that when a runtime map needs to go offline, it can simply see which packages are available, pick the appropriate one, and download them. There's no generation of data required at the time that the app needs to pull the data offline. So this is very scalable. We can have a single package and hundreds or thousands of users downloading that package to work offline. Once they've got the map on the device, they can collect data, they can synchronize, make edits, and so forth. Here's what it looks like in a little bit of pseudocode. So we create this thing called an offline map task, pointing it at the web map. So here at this point, we are clearly are connected to the network. And we query it to find what the pre-planned map areas are. These are the areas that the author of the map has predetermined need to be packaged up 
for availability offline. We pick one of those. With the offline map task, we create a set of parameters for that specific area, and we create something called a, a download pre-planned map area job by passing in the parameters and telling it where on the device we want the downloaded map to live. We start the job, and when it's finished, we'll have a fully hydrated map that we can just pass to our map view. And we have an interactive map directly on the device. In the on-demand workflow, the author simply publishes the map. And when a device needs to go offline, it specifies an area of interest that it wants to take offline, along with potentially numerous other parameters, but at least an area of interest. And it requests that map to be generated for them to be taken offline. Now, at this point, the portal backend has to do the work of packaging up the various bits of data, the operational data, the base maps, and so forth. But ultimately, it ends up with the same set of data downloaded to the device, and the device can then go offline and make edits and synchronize those edits back up when connectivity is available again. However, each time a device needs to take that map offline, there's work to be done on the portal backend. So while this is more flexible in terms of being able to take areas offline without planning ahead, it doesn't scale nearly as well as the pre-planned solution because your server will have to be doing work every time a map needs to be taken offline. This is what the code looks like for that. Similarly, as, as with the pre-planned, we create an offline map task pointing it to the web map, but this time we simply generate parameters given an area of interest rather than querying which areas are available to download we specify the geography ourselves, and that can be a polygon or, a, or an envelope. And then it's the same. We just create this generate offline map job, given the parameters and the location on the device that we want the map to be downloaded to. We start the job, and when it's finished, we have this fully hydrated offline map that we can just drop into a map view. So once we've taken maps offline, how about keeping them up to date, getting the most up-to-date map from the source onto the device, and in an always disconnected approach using the mobile map package in ArcGIS Pro, you simply recreate the mobile map package and redeploy it to the device. In the occasionally connected scenario, we have an offline map sync task. This can take the offline map that was generated either in the on-demand or pre-planned workflow and is sitting on the device and compare it to the source web map and synchronize things as appropriate. It's up to you to figure out when to do that. Do you do it opportunistically in the field when you have good network connectivity? Do you do it once a day, once a week? You also have a lot of control over exactly how that sync happens. Do you simply download updates from the source? Or if you have edits, do you push those back up? And you can actually get fine grain control layer by layer on how that works. So here's a diagram of how all this comes together. In the pre-planned or on-demand workflow, an offline map makes its way onto the device when we have network connectivity. We can work with that on the device, whether there's network connectivity or not make edits to it, interact with it, and so forth. When we do get our network back, or we know that we have network, we're then able to synchronize. We can choose to make it a bi-directional sync, simply upload our edits, or download the changes only. And in the case of the pre-planned maps, we actually have something relatively new called the scheduled updates approach. This only supports read-only workflows, but it makes it very scalable to push small changes out to a large number of devices that have pulled down pre-planned maps. Synchronizing the map is very straightforward. Here's some pseudocode for it. We create an offline map sync task pointing to that offline map that we've got previously, either through pre-planned or on demand. We generate some default sync parameters. And here we have the opportunity to define which layers should be bidirectional, download only, upload only. And then we simply create a job to synchronize the map, and we call start. Once it's finished, the map will be up to date. There's nothing else we have to do, like getting hold of a map and passing it to a map view. So let's take a quick look behind the scenes of what's happening. And this is important just to understand the capabilities of the runtime and the flexibility that you have as you're developing your app. If we remember the web map diagram we saw earlier, we have the web map itself with its layers pointing to these services on the right. Now, these services on the right map to offline files that are pulled down as part of that mobile map package. And for each of these types, there's actually a runtime task. You can use this task to pull down 
these data sources yourself if you wanted to, but the offline map task and map sync tasks actually take care of all this behind the scenes for you. So in summary, there's two main ways to bring data offline for your runtime apps. The first is to generate this mobile map package or MMPK single file from ArcGIS Pro. And the other is to leverage a web map and use the offline map task. They both have specific use cases they support. MMPKs are read-only. The offline map task allows you to edit and sync. It has a pre-planned or on-demand approach for working with it, depending on your data, on, on how your data is updated, how frequently it's updated, the scalability you need for your field workers. And in the offline map task, there are various optimizations and overrides. I touched on being able to configure each individual layer for a specific direction, but there's a number more and I encourage you to check out one of these other sessions that goes into more detail on all of these. And with that, I'll hand over to Mark to talk about annotation. Thanks, Nick. So annotation is something which will be very familiar to many utilities companies, but for to those of you who have not come across it before, I'm just going to give a short overview of what it is. So it's probably best described as just being text on a map, as the picture here shows. But this is actually different to labeling. So labeling is something which is positioned dynamically and it's always associated with a feature attribute. So this is dynamically drawn and deconflicted on the screen every time you sort of pan and zoom the map. Now annotation is different. It's actually stored in its own specific layer, an annotation layer, and it's always positioned in the same place. It's a fixed size and it's also optimized as a specific reference scale of the map. Now it can be independent, so it's just text on the, uh, on the map, or it can be feature linked. So when it's feature linked, it can be linked to a feature. So if you change an attribute on that feature, then potentially that could be updating the text in your annotation. Now, in terms of support in the ArcGIS platform for annotation, it's currently supported in ArcGIS Runtime 100.7, our latest release, and ArcGIS Pro 2.4, and the hosting environment for that is ArcGIS Enterprise, and it has to be greater than 100.7.1. Now, annotation is currently not supported in ArcGIS Online, and consequently, the web map or the JavaScript API, but that will be coming in a future release. Now, in terms of supported annotation workflows, there are three when you're working with runtime applications. So the simplest is when you're actually working with feature and annotation layer that you're just reading directly as services from your own ArcGIS enterprise. The next one we have is if you have a read-only mobile map package which has been published from ArcGIS Pro, you can open that up and look at in your uh, runtime application. But this is a read-only workflow. And then finally, um, you can work with sync-enabled geodatabases that will enable you to work with editable offline feature and also view your annotation data too. So let's go and take a look at these workflows in a little bit more detail. So starting off with just the basic online support. So this is where ArcGIS Pro will have published to your ArcGIS Enterprise an annotation layer. And this can simply be consumed with your ArcGIS Runtime application. Let's just go and take a look at some code. So this is some Java code. Um, so if you're a .NET developer, don't be offended by this because in the runtime, we do have a common design strategy where the naming convention that we use for all classes and the associated properties, methods, and events are exactly the same. So this code um, will make sense to all runtime developers, even though it is Java. And just to balance things out, we will be showing some .NET code later on in this uh, session. So just getting back to the code, we're instantiating here a new annotation layer, uh, and that is um, passing in, in the constructor, the URL of the annotation feature service that we're going to be working with. And then it's just simply a case of adding that into the operational layers collection for my map, which in turn will be associated with the map view, so I can visualize and interact with that data in my application. So nice and straightforward. Now the next uh, workflow I want to talk about here is when we can work with a mobile map package. 
So the workflow here is using ArcGIS Pro, you will have published uh, your data inside a mobile map package. This mobile map package will contain your annotation and your feature services and potentially your base map as well. And that package needs to be side loaded onto the device which contains your runtime application and that enables you to be able to read the data, but not edit it. This is just a read only workflow. So just taking a look at the code that you would require to be able to open up one of these mobile map packages. We're going to start off here by instantiating a mobile map package class and in the constructor for that I'm passing in the name of the, uh, the path that contains the file. And then asynchronously I'm going to load that and listen in for the, uh, the file to be loaded. And you can see here I'm just doing a check to make sure the load status is loaded here. Um, if, that, if that fails it'll be sort of in going into a failed to load status and I can have error handling. So that's the kind of thing that would happen if it couldn't find the file for example. So assuming all is well, it's just a case of opening up the mobile map package and extracting the map so that, that I can then associate that with the, uh, the map view that I'm going to be interacting with and visualizing the data. So again, nice and straightforward. And the final workflow is when we can work with a uh, sync enabled offline geodatabase. So we've got here an annotation feature layer which has been published in ArcGIS Pro. And inside my runtime application, I will have made a request using the, uh, the geodatabase sync task to create an offline geodatabase that I can sideload onto my device. So this is for a specific geographic area where you want to work offline. And then that offline geodatabase will contain, well, annotation and feature data uh, potentially. And then I can then read that and also edit the feature data um, using my runtime application. So looking at the code for that, I'm going to start off by opening up my geodatabase by instantiating a geodatabase class and passing, passing in the, uh, the file path. And then I'm going to load it and asynchronously I'm going to listen in to the, uh, the load status and assuming all is well and I found the file, I'm going to start looping through the tables inside the geodatabase so I can filter the tables which contain annotation, which is what I'm doing in this loop here. So I'm getting the, the geodatabase annotation tables and for each one of those tables, I'm creating myself an annotation layer and adding that into the operational layers in my map. And then just to complete the picture, I'm going to go through, you can see the code at the bottom here, going through the tables that contain the feature data and I'll add those to uh, my map. So very straightforward workflow. And then I can then edit the, uh, the feature data as I would do in a normal offline editing workflow. So just to complete the picture here, just showing all of the, uh, the workflows, we've got ArcGIS Runtime here in the middle. Um, and ArcGIS Runtime, it can read the data from the mobile map packages that you can export from ArcGIS Pro. I can read the data directly from my enterprise server, so reading the, uh, the REST endpoints directly, or I can actually read from a, an offline geodatabase which contain editable features and also annotation too. Okay, thank you. I was going to hand you back now to Rich. Thanks, Mark. Let's talk now about the new utility network functionality available in runtime. So for those not familiar with it, the Utility Network is Esri's next generation network technology for electric, gas, water, wastewater, and telecom utilities. Now the system is completely services based, running on ArcGIS Enterprise, and was first introduced into the ArcGIS platform with ArcGIS Pro 2.1 and Enterprise 2.6. It's now available with ArcGIS Runtime. Our first release was 100.6 in mid-2019, and we've added enhancements in 100.7. It's important to understand that this is an iterative development process and we'll be adding additional functionality into 100.8 and subsequent releases. Now the rest of this talk is going to assume that you have a basic knowledge of utility network concepts. Um, if you don't have that already, there are a couple other Dev Summit sessions you might want to view first. So the Utility Network API is 
kind of broken up into four areas, um, a section called foundational classes, and then we have classes around schema, tracing, and associations. We're going to talk about each one of those in turn. Now the foundational classes, um, we have a utility network class and a utility element class. The utility network class serves as the central hub for the utility network API. And you create this, you know, using the constructor, using the URL to the feature service that holds your utility network, as well as a map. Now passing in a map allows us to link up what we call network sources inside the utility network and link those up to the service feature tables that represent the tables that represent the tables in your map. The utility element class is kind of a helpful class um, used throughout the system. It represents a row inside a utility network plus a terminal or a percent along edge if applicable. So we use this throughout the API. We use it to retrieve associations, to specify starting points and barriers for use with tracing as inputs. And when you do a trace, you get your results back as a set of elements. Now, when you're creating these yourself, there's a create element, a set of create element factory methods on the utility network class that allow you to do this. So the schema classes, um, the API comes with a set of classes that provide read-only access to all of the utility network schema information. You start with a class called the utility network definition. Um, this is pretty easy to obtain. You just call the definition property on the utility network object. Now there's a whole set of schema objects, um, domain networks, tiers, network sources, asset groups. Um, if you're familiar with the utility network at all, you're probably familiar with these already. Um, if you're familiar with the pro SDK for the utility network, you notice that there's an almost identical diagram that goes along with that. It's the same, the, the objects here and their properties follow the same patterns um, established by the underlying um, information model. We also support a set of classes to support, to, to perform network analysis. So tracing um, entails assembling a subset of elements that meet a specified criteria. That's kind of the, uh, the computer science definition, but we all know um, from a business perspective that this, the tracing uses network data to you know, answer business questions and provide value to utilities. It can answer problems and answer questions about the current state of the network. It can help design future facilities and help organize business practices. Now, if you're familiar with all the functionality in the utility network, um, it's worth pointing out that we're only supporting a subset of this with 100.7, a subset of the trace types and a subset of the trace parameters. So the trace types we support, we support a connected trace along with the three sub-network based traces. So a connected trace is pretty easy to envision. It's simply um, are these um, lines and uh, points connected to one another. It doesn't necessarily use any kind of business knowledge behind it. It's just a, a treating it as a network graph. Now for the sub-networks, sub-network based traces, sub-networks are collections of connected utility network features. And I mean connected in a domain sense. So for example, for an electric utility, a subnetwork would represent a circuit, whereas for a gas or water utility, um, it would represent a zone, like a pressure zone or a cathodic protection zone. Now typically you're, you start at a source, and there could be multiple sources, for example a circuit breaker, or they end at a sink, for example, a sewage treatment plant if you're modeling wastewater. And they're typically based on a trace configuration which defines the extent of the subnetwork. So for example, a gas zone will stop at a closed valve. So just some quick examples of how the subnetwork based tracing works. Consider this network here, the lines are electric lines um, and we have shown here a circuit source in the lower left and a starting point for our trace kind of there in the middle center. So if you were to run a subnetwork trace from this point, it would return the extent of the entire circuit. So typically you would use this to you know, visualize the coverage of a circuit, perhaps to plan inspection and damage assessment work. 
Now an upstream trace returns paths leading to the source. So some typical uses would be just visualizing how um, power flows from the source, but it can also be used to find broken devices that are preventing power flow. And a downstream trace returns paths leading away from the source, so typically used for things like visualizing the impact of a device failure. So on the trace parameter side, we again support a subset of these. Starting points and barriers can be placed on lines, points, or within uh, within a device in a specific terminal. So these do pretty much what you think they do, right? A starting point allows you to start a trace, and a barrier is kind of manually telling you to stop a trace at a particular point. Now, most of the time when you want to stop a trace, you want to do it um, using some kind of expression. So, for example, traversability. So you can define a traversability expression using a network attribute or category comparison. So what this does is allows you to specify when a trace stops using those network attributes or categories. So for example, you could define a trace to stop when you find an open device for an electric network, or perhaps do a trace that stops when you hit a um, protective device, um, again, on that kind of network. The other way we can specify traversability is through what's called a function barrier, and this specifies when a trace stops by using the result of a function calculation. So for example, if you're doing a telecom trace, if you're doing an OTDR trace, and you want to stop where the fiber length is greater than or equal to 1100 meters, you'll have a trace that runs out 1100 meters in all directions from your starting point. And finally, we have propagators that allow you to model the propagation of a network attribute. This is used for things like phase in an electric network or pressure in a gas network. So the last section of classes in our runtime API, we have some routines dealing with associations. So if you're familiar with the utility network, you know we support three different types of associations. Connectivity, which allows you to connect two points that are not um, don't have the same X, Y, Z. They're not coincident ge geometrically. We allow you to specify containment. So you can say um, this container, so this transformer bank, contains um, a particular device. It would allow you to specify structural attachment. So a um, transformer bank is attached to a pole, for example. So the association support right now is we allow you to get an association's from a particular utility element um, and you do this from the utility network object by calling a routine called get associations async. So you know for example you can return all of the associations associated with a transformer bank or you can just get the associations of a particular type. So I can say just get me the content of this transformer bank. So it's a little hard to talk about that all in the abstract, so I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer to give us some demos and show us how this all works. Thanks, Rich. This Windows desktop application references ArcGIS Runtime SDK for .NET 100.7. When we introduce tracing a subnetwork, finding associations for an element, and rendering asset groups in a composite layer. We can place our starting location by identifying a feature in our map from which we create a utility element. Subnetwork traces require that we specify a source tier. This medium voltage radial tier defines a trace configuration that will stop traversability when it finds an open device. An upstream trace in a source-based network like electric will discover elements that go against the flow of resource. This must be our subnetwork controller source. Since this element supports more than one terminal, we'd have to choose one before we run another trace. A downstream trace from its load side will discover elements that go with the flow of resource. Without any barriers, we can expect the entire subnetwork to be returned. And if we specify a barrier and run the same trace, we can expect fewer results. 
To better understand our network, we can again identify a feature in our map and from which create a utility element. From this utility element, we can get a list of associations. We can see that this fuse is contained in the switchgear cell. It is connected to this other fuse and it is attached to the pad underneath. How do we know that there's a pad there? Subtype feature layers is especially useful in utility networks or any feature service layer that defines a subtype. In utility network, this subtype is called an asset group. This structure junction layer defines an asset group or a subtype called switch gear, which we can now control as though it were its own layer. We can update its visible property, change the min scale, change the renderer, and all of which reveals that there is a pad underneath. Now let's see some code. In all of the demo, here's how we build the map. We create and load a utility network from a feature server endpoint. From its definition network sources, we got the feature table used to create the feature layer or a subtype feature layer if we want access to the sublayers. We add this layer to the map operational layers. We also got a list of tiers from the list of the domain networks that is available in the utility network definition. We added a graphics overlay to help visualize our trace locations. And here's how we collected them. We subscribed to the GeoView tapped event of the map view, and we identified a feature from which we created a utility element. From its asset type terminal configuration, we were able to see the list of supported terminals. To visualize the trace location, we created a graphic with the same geometry as the identified feature or simply use the tap location. We assigned a symbol that is appropriate for its purpose, and we added that graphic to a graphics overlay. To run a trace, we build the trace parameters using the selected trace type and the collected starting locations. We also added any barriers that we have collected. And we set the trace configuration based on the selected tier trace configuration. We pass these parameters to trace async to get a collection of trace results. In this release, there is only one kind, a utility element trace result. It has a collection of elements that can be transformed to features using get features for elements async. And it is these features that we select on the layers. To find associations for a given element, we again created a utility element from a feature and passed this on to get associations async, which gave us a collection of utility association. Each of this association has an element piece that can be transformed back to features using the same method get features for elements async, just like before. For displaying the asset groups, we use XAML binding. XAML is short for Extensible Application Markup Language. This defines a graphical user interface. You see here that there is a map view, which is a runtime control that contains the map and all the layers. If you remember, we had two combo boxes. One is bound to the map operational layers, while the other is bound to the subtype sublayers property of whatever is selected on the first combo box. We also had a checkbox that is bound to the is visible property of whatever is selected on the subtype sublayers. Similarly, when we handle the change renderer or the change min scale, we grab the subtype sublayer that was selected and we updated either its renderer or the symbol associated with that renderer. When we updated the min scale, we grabbed the map view's current viewpoint and from this got the target scale. We can update the min scale the max scale, and other properties of this layer, such as labeling info, definition expressions, pop-up definitions. We invite you to explore Utility Network in ArcGIS Runtime. Back to you, Rich. Thanks, Jim. 
Let's wrap up by talking a little bit about the road ahead for the utility network APIs in future releases of runtime. So coming in 100.8, we're adding support for terminal paths to the schema classes. On the tracing area, um, we are adding support for the isolation trace. Very important for gas and water users to be able to do that valve isolation trace and find which valves to close in order to um, stop the flow of gas or water to a particular location. We're also supporting tracing filters. This enables, um, enables business processes like the upstream protective device trace. Um, we also have the nearest neighbor filter along with that. And on the association side, we're providing a graphical visualization so you can see lines on your map connecting the uh, features that are connected with a connectivity association or a structural attachment association. Now, as I said at the very beginning section of this, um, runtime is a work in progress or adding utility network to, the, to runtime is a work in project progress. Um, coming up in future releases beyond 100.8, we know we need to complete the tracing functionality by adding support for output filters, functions, and for a couple other trace types. We plan on adding support for branch versioning, so technically this isn't the utility network specific, but all utility networks use branch versioning. The idea here is to allow collector and whatever custom editing applications you write to edit utility network data while connected to a specific branch version. Um, very importantly, we're working on offline support. So as we talked about at the beginning of this talk, you can take features offline today. However, you cannot take a utility network offline. So the features that make up that utility network can go offline, so you can do things like poll inspections and things like that. But what we want to do is, and what we're working on, is allowing all of the tracing and associations to also work offline. Um, we want to add support for editing, and then finally some level of support for subnetworks. So thank you for watching, and let us know if you have any questions.